So it's been 10 years. Unlike DHH, I can't get up here and tell you I've been doing Rails for 10 years. I've been doing Rails for 9 or 8 or something like that. But Rails has been around for 10 years, and so it's not surprising that a bunch of people are going to get up here and do a little bit of a, a retrospective. So this is sort of my feeling. Oh my god, I remember uh, sort of thinking back in 2008 when uh, DHH was, was giving his talk about sort of a look back around the same year that MERB was becoming a thing. And, DHA, and we were eventually going to you know, merge a little, a little bit later. But in 2008, when DHH gave the great surplus talk, um, that was sort of a retrospective year, too, because we had, we had gotten to the point where Rails was big enough that it could actually host a competitor. Um, and I think it's really great that we ended up merging in and we ended up getting another five, six years of, of, great, uh, of a great framework community. Um, but now's another opportunity to look back and think about sort of what, what the Rails community is and how you should think about taking the, the lessons from, uh, of Rails to other environments. And that's sort of what my talk is about today. So I'm going to start by saying, I think if you think about one thing about Rails, if you want to think about uh, what Rails is above anything else, I think Rails popularized the idea of convention over configuration. And you've been hearing the term convention over configuration for 10 years now. So probably. It's sort of, it's a meaningless term. It's sort of like when you hear the same word over and over and over again, eventually you reach semantic saturation. I think we've all reached semantic saturation of the term convention over configuration. But I want to unpack it a little bit. I think one way of thinking about it is, uh, is this other term called the paradox of choice, this idea that people, well, I'll let DHH say what it is, people like choices a lot more than they like having to actually choose. Right? So there's this, I think this sort of, uh, narrow point, but it's still a very important point, which is that people go into environments, uh, they go into programming environments or groceries or whatever, and they like the idea of having a whole lot of choices a lot more than they like having to actually choose what to do. And this is sort of the state of the art. This is what we knew in 2008 um, when David gave the great surplus talk back then. And what I want to do is go a little bit beyond uh, sort of these, these pithy points and talk a little bit about what, what's happening? What is actually going on that's causing this idea to occur? What's hap causing the paradox of choice? And actually, there's been a lot of science. Even in 2008, there was science. But in between uh, 2008 and now, or certainly 2004 and now, there's been a tremendous amount of science about what is causing the paradox of choice. What is causing convention of a configuration to be effective? And if you want to Google it, if you want to go find something, uh, more information about this on Wikipedia, uh, the term is called ego depletion, sometimes uh, the idea of cognitive depletion. And in order to understand what's happening here, you first need to understand, you first need to think about sort of like your everyday, your everyday job, your every, how you feel during the day. So you wake up in the morning, you get out, you go out of the house. And you're pretty much fully charged. You're ready to attack the world. You, hopefully it's sunny, and you can skip down the street. And you're, you're ready to do anything. You're ready. You have all the, the, the cognitive resources in the world. And then you, know, you get to your desk. <laughs> I find it amusing that that character is a programmer. It's so perfect. Um, so you get to your desk. You know, you've, you've done a little bit of work. And your cognitive resources start to deplete a little bit. You get a little bit fewer cognitive resources. You know, eventually something happens during the day <laughs> that you might not, that might not be so pleasant, and your cognitive resources deplete. Um, and then you reach a point at some point during the day. This is a Van Gogh painting. Uh, you reach a point sometime during the day where you're really flagging. You're feeling like you don't have a lot of capacity left to, to do anything or to think hard. And eventually you totally run out. You run out of cognitive resources entirely, and you're done. And so the idea here is the concept of cognitive depletion or ego depletion. You have a certain amount of resources, and they run out. And I think most people think about this in terms of like your day job, right? So you wake up in the morning. Throughout the day, you run, your resources deplete. You get to the end of the day, you're out of resources, rinse and repeat. I think that's how most people think about it, and that's sort of how I framed it here. But the really interesting thing about ego depletion or cognitive depletion is that what actually turns out to be the case is that there's sort of this one, there's this one big pool of resources, this one battery, that's actually used for a lot of different things. And so there's a lot of studies about things like um, grocery stores, right? So why is it that when you go to a grocery store, why do you find yourself so uh, willing to buy something at the impulse, at the impulse aisle, right, or at the end, of the, the end of the grocery trip? 
And the reason is that you spent all this time in the grocery store doing not very difficult activities, but you're making a lot of choices. So you're making choices the entire time as you're walking around the grocery store, and eventually your brain just runs out of resources to do anything else. And it's actually drawing from the same pool of resources that willpower comes from. So even though choice making and willpower feel like two totally different things, when you get to the end of the grocery trip and you've used all your resources on choice making, you're out of resources to not buy the candy bar at the, at the impulse, uh, from the impulse aisle. Um, and the same thing is true about a lot of things. They've done studies where they'll just take two halves of a room like this one and they'll say, you guys memorize two, two numbers, you guys memorize seven numbers, and then when, you, when they're totally done and you've done the memorization, they'll take you into a processing room and they'll say, okay, you have you know, cookies and you have some fruit, and you get to basically decide which one to eat. And it turns out that the people who did the not much more difficult job of memorizing seven numbers are far more likely to eat the cookies. And the same thing is true in the other direction. If you have people eat cookies first and then go and do a cognitively difficult task, so a task that requires um, one of the most famous experiments has to do with an impossible task. How long can people persevere doing a task that you can literally never finish? Um, and it turns out that people who eat the cookies first uh, actually ha spend a lot more time trying to do the impossible task than the people that, that uh, were, had to sit in front of a tray of cookies and were told not to eat it. And so there's, there's all these experiments. There's, uh, by now in 2014, there's a ton of them. And basically what they show in aggregate is that there's this pool of resources that we have to do our job challenging tasks. Uh, to, to do cognitive dissonance, so there's studies around, if you just tell people, you need to get up and give a speech about something that's different than what you actually believe. People who do that actually have less willpower afterwards, they have less ability to do challenging tasks, they have less general cognitive resources than people who are asked to give a speech about something they do believe, even if the actual act of giving the speech is equally, uh, is equally difficult. And so I think what's kind of interesting about this is that really what we want in programming is we want to be doing having as much time as we can for the challenging tasks, right? We want to be spending all of our time on challenging tasks and as little of those very scarce resources as we can on things like the willpower to write your code in exactly the right way or uh, making a lot of choices. And here are some terms that you might have heard uh, basically about this, um, paradox of choice or ego depletion or the concept of decision fatigue. These are all ways that you've heard that describe this general concept, this general concept of you just have this battery, and it runs out at some point, and there's all these really counterintuitive things that don't seem like they're very hard, but are taking away resources that you need to work on hard problems. So how do we, how do we solve this? How do we actually solve this problem? Because obviously it's the case that you, if you want to be spending a lot of time on your challenging problems, if you just ignore the problem of willpower or the problem of, uh, of choices, you're just going to end up making a lot of mindless choices all day. And so what we need to do is we need to find some psychological hacks that we can apply that will keep us doing the right thing basically all the time, keep us from wasting cognitive uh, resources. And I think my favorite study about, about this, about the kinds of cognitive hacks that work effectively, is the idea of um, what happens to organ donation if the organ donation requirement is opt-in, in other words, you go to the DMV and there's a form that says, yes, I agree to donate my organs, and here are the ones I agree to donate. And when the organ donation is opt-out, in other words, you have to explicitly say, I do, not want, I, I do not want my organs to be donated. And what you can see is that in the countries where it's opt-in, it's actually a very, very uh, low rate. And in the countries where it's opt-out, it's a surprisingly high rate. It's basically almost universal. And I, and I think, to, to some degree, you might expect that this is the case. But I think this difference is really counterintuitive, because um, you would expect that if somebody you know, goes and they're sitting at a forum, and the forum says, do you want to donate your organs? And the excuse that they're telling themselves in their head for not checking the checkbox is, you know, my mom would be super angry if she found out, or my religion tells me that I shouldn't do this. Or you know, growing up, I heard people say negative things, or whatever. Whatever the excuses you tell yourself to not check the checkbox, you would think that some of those people, more than 0.1% you know, of those people, would pick up the pen and opt out. But the interesting thing is that by just changing the default from yes to no, all of a sudden, all those excuses, all the things that people tell themselves about the reasons that they really shouldn't check the checkbox suddenly go away. And what's, I think, even more interesting about this is that 
these choices are actually made on, on really big DMV forms. So you basically what you can see is that people have already gone through this really complicated, um, somewhat trivial but very uh, choice heavy process of filling out this DMV form. And by the time they get to the bottom and are asked about organ donation, they're so cognitively depleted that they have no energy left to even really think about it. They basically just do the default. So I think, honestly, defaults are our most powerful psychological hack, our most powerful weapon in trying to deal with the, pro the fact that we have this limited source of cognitive capacity that we want to make good use of when we're programming. And the really cool thing about defaults in general is that defaults are actually really effective on both sides of the spectrum. So some days, you get to work, you're ready to go, you're like in an amazing mood, everything is perfect, everything is awesome. And on those days, the defaults, you have a big store of cognitive resources, and the defaults keep you high up. They keep you in the, in the charge state for a longer time. You don't have to make choices that would go deplete. And remember, the choice making doesn't deplete per minute. It's not every minute of choices depletes. It's every choice depletes your cognitive resources. So having a set of defaults that tells you, here is what you're going to do in general, and you have, to, you, know, you have to think hard to opt out, that's really great when you're in a good mood, when things are charged. But it's actually also really great when you're in a bad mood, when you're really depleted and you still have to go to work and do your job, because the default keeps you on the straight and narrow, right? You don't have enough energy left to really think about what you're doing. And so everybody has bad days. Everybody works on teams with developers who aren't great. <laughs> Let me say it differently. Everyone has at some point worked on a team. Hopefully not. But you, you have junior developers. You, know, you hire people who are, who are new to whatever it is that you're doing, or you have a bad day. Um, or you're stressed out because your mom gave you a call at lunch and now you're in a bad mood, right? So everybody gets to a point where they have cognitively... My mother's going to be so angry now. <laughs> Let's say an ex-girlfriend or whatever. <laughs> so everyone has days where they're cognitively depleted. And on those days, defaults are also really powerful because they keep you, when you, instead of having you be sort of in a bad mood and you'll just sort of do whatever you, know, you feel like, you're basically kept on the straight and narrow. You're kept on the right path. And I think this actually helps to explain why yak shaving doesn't feel as good as you might think. So yak shaving isn't the most terrible activity in the world. I think sometimes you need to yak shave. But I think if you think about doing like four hours of yak shaving in an eight-hour day, pretty much after four hours, if you, you know, let me set up my, you know, my vagrant box or let me go set up my testing environment, Right? After like four hours of that, you're totally cognitively depleted. It doesn't matter that you only spent four hours out of an eight-hour day. Basically, you have no more cognitive resources left. And I think this, this means we should be very careful about yak shaving. Because yak shaving may feel good and, and it may be important in a lot of cases. But we need to be very honest about the fact that there's, uh, there's a certain amount of, of cognitive resources that we have. And yak shaving takes up more of them um, than you would expect. And they don't leave us time after even two hours or three hours, they don't leave us a lot of cognitive resources to actually do the task that we were yak shaving towards. So obviously, uh, occasionally, you need to you know, refactor and, and do all kinds of these kinds of tasks. But you should be careful about thinking that you'll get a lot done afterwards. Um, so I think this is sort of the unpacking. This is the scientific unpacking of what it is that we're talking about. But, and I think everyone in this room can nod their heads along with what I'm saying. They can agree with what I'm saying. Makes sense. But what ends up happening in the rest of the world, and also uh, there's usually a devil on your shoulder, um, is that people find all kinds of excuses to argue against the thing I just said. So I just out outlined sort of an unpacking of the convention over configuration story. And somehow, we as a, as a human race actually find a lot of ways to, to argue against these things. And one of, these, one of these ways that we find to argue against it is to tell ourselves that we're unique and we're special. And I'll just let David from 2008 talk about this for a second. One point I keep coming back to over and over again when I talk about Ruby and Rails is um, that we confessed commonality. We confessed the fact that we're not as special as we like to believe. We confess that we're not the only ones trying to climb the same mountain. And I think this is a really important point because it's somewhat counterintuitive, I think, for a lot of developers to think that they're not that special. 
I think it's counterintuitive for humans in general to think they're not that special. But when they do think that they're special, when they do think that they're the only ones climbing that mountain, they kind of get these assumptions that they need very unique and special tools that will only work for them. And I think that's a really bad way to approach getting greater productivity. Because I think what really makes this special and makes it work is all the points where we recognize that we're exactly the same. And I think that's really the point, is that the way we gain better productivity is by pushing back against this impulse. I think we have it in the Rails community to some degree. I think it's especially significant outside the Rails community where people didn't already come together around the idea that we're going to build shared tools and shared solutions. But I think we really do have to push back against this idea. And I think my favorite example of this sort of uh, taken to an absurdist extreme um, is sort of famous interview. What is your most surprising app on the home screen? Well, it's Operator. It's a custom design, one of a kind, bespoke app I had built for my assistant and I to communicate and collaborate. Did this person need a custom, bespoke, one-of-a-kind application to communicate with their assistant? No, almost certainly not. But they decided that they were so special, they were so, they themselves were so one-of-a-kind, such a unique snowflake, that they needed a special tool to communicate with their assistant. And I think this is sort of how, this is how we act, this is how we behave. And if you look at sort of how people talk about software, you, say, you see things like, this is a tool set for building the framework most suited to your application development. Your application, your company, your industry is so special that you can't use general purpose tools. You need to use a tool set to build your own framework. Or in an ecosystem where overarching decides everything for you, frameworks are commonplace, and many libraries require your site to be reorganized to suit their look, feel, and default behavior, we should continue to be a tool that gives you the freedom to design the full experience of your web application. And who could be against freedom, right? <laughs> freedom is a really effective uh, uh, thing to put on the wall to say, this is the thing that we're arguing for. We're arguing for freedom. But this is just another way, it's just another way that, you, that people's brains sneak in arguments against, uh, that, that helped us create the paradox of choice in the first place. Right? People say, you know, I'm special. I can't use these shared tools. I can't use these tools that were built for everybody. I need to use special tools. I need to use small libraries that help me build my own abstractions. I can't share with the community. And then even if people come to the conclusion that maybe abstractions, maybe shared solutions are a good idea, then you get another argument. The devil on your shoulder or the devil in your community makes another argument, which is the law of leaky abstractions. And this is not, this is sort of like the law of Demeter. It's not a suggestion or an observation. It's a law, the law of leaky abstractions. And I think any time somebody couches an observation about software development as a law, you know something fishy is going on. You know that something's not right. Because software development isn't a science. You, basically, people want you to put on your science hat and say, ah, it's a law. It's like the law of gravity. I can derive some conclusions from this law. What, what, what conclusions do they want you to derive? Abstractions are bad. You should never use abstractions. You should do everything yourself. And so this uh, law of leaky abstractions was originally built by, uh, uh, written by Joel Spolsky. And Jeff Atwood, who was his partner at Stack Overflow, actually responded, I think, kind of brilliantly to this. And he said, you know, I'd argue that virtually all good programming abstractions are failed abstractions. I don't think I've ever used one that didn't leak like a sieve. But I think that's an awfully architecture astronaut way of looking at things. Instead, let's ask ourselves a more pragmatic question. Does this abstraction make our code at least a little easier to write? to understand, to troubleshoot? Are we better off with this abstraction than we were without it? It's our job as modern programmers not to abandon abstractions due to these deficiencies, but to embrace the useful elements of them, to adapt the working parts and construct ever so slightly less leaky and broken abstractions over time. And I think people use this idea, these excuses, things like the law of leaky abstractions, to give an excuse for themselves to not share solutions. And I think sort of the hilarious thing, and this is sort of a compressed, super conflated set of abstractions. Every single one of us is sitting on top of abstractions that maybe occasionally leak, but really, how many people ever have to drop down into the x86 or the ARM level, or even the C level, right? People, we can build higher and higher sets of abstractions, 
And we, could keep, we can keep building on top of these abstractions and build and allow us to sort of eliminate more and more code that we had to write before, that we had to write in 1960, 1970, 1980. Sort of every year is another set of things that we have discovered as a community that we don't have to worry about, that we're shared. And I think sort of people look at this and they say, oh my god, it's a pile of hacks. It's hacks on hacks on hacks on hacks. But actually it's not. Actually what's going on here is that every single time you start off with this sort of experimental playground, people are building, you know, at the bottom layer, people were building their own hardware. And eventually people came to the conclusion that you don't have to build your own hardware. We can standardize around things like x86. And then we standardized around it and people stopped worrying about all the craziness that was underneath. And then people said, we can build C. And if we build C, people can stop worrying most of the time about what's below it. So really every one of these layers is not a pile of hacks built on a pile of hacks. It's us as a group of people, as a community of programmers, deciding that 90% of the things that we're doing, we figured out we don't actually need to, to worry about. And I think fundamentally this is about sort of the history of programming, is that we have shared solutions. We make progress by building up the stack, by eliminating code that we didn't have to write. And Steve Jobs actually talked about this in 1995, sort of exactly the same thing. So let me let him talk. Because it's all about managing complexity, right? You're developers, you know that. It's all about managing complexity. It's like scaffolding, right? You erect some scaffolding, and if you keep going up and up and up, eventually the scaffolding collapses of its own weight, right? That's what building software is. It's how much scaffolding can you erect before the whole thing collapses of its own weight. Doesn't matter how many people you have working on it. Doesn't matter if you're Microsoft with three, four hundred people, five hundred people on the team. It will collapse under its own weight. You've read the Mythical Man Month, right? Basic premise of this is a software development project is to a certain size where if you add one more person, the amount of energy to communicate with that person is actually greater than their net contribution to the project, so it slows down. So you have local maximum and then it comes down. We all know that about software. It's about managing complexity. These tools allow you to not have to worry about 90% of the stuff you've worried about so that you can erect your five stories of scaffolding but starting at story number 23 instead of starting at story number six. You can get a lot higher. And I think that's fundamentally what we do as software people. For all of the complaints that people make about you know, oh my god, every abstraction leaks. All we've ever done, even, in, even as far back as, uh, you know, in the 60s, but even in 1995, uh, Steve Jobs was already talking about this idea that we can build higher by building shared solutions. And I'm going to uh, let him speak one more time, um, because I think really, it's really fascinating how much this idea of how you get better programmer productivity hasn't really changed fundamentally since that time. But on top of that, we're going to put something called OpenStep. <laughs> and OpenStep lets you start developing your apps on the 20th floor. And the kinds of apps you can deliver are phenomenal. But there's another hidden advantage. Most of the great breakthroughs, the page makers, the illustrators, et cetera, the directors, come from smaller software companies. It's been said a few times today. They don't come from the large software companies. They come from the smaller ones. And the, one of the greatest things is that using this new technology, two people or three people in a garage can build an app and get it from concept to market in six to nine months that is every bit as feature rich, every bit as reliable, and every bit as exciting as a giant software company can do with a 150 person team. <clears throat> It's phenomenal. So I think what's kind of cool about this is that this idea that we can take shared problems that everyone has, shared problems that a community of people have solving the same problem, and we can build up shared solutions. This is not new. It's not, it shouldn't be controversial. It's kind of fundamental to what we do as software developers, and yet, if someone isn't up here telling you this, it's so, it's so easy to forget. There are so many excuses that people tell themselves. Um, sort of what happens in reality is you have this bulk of shared solutions. You have an area of experimentation, sort of the Wild West, and you let the area of experimentation fold back into shared solutions. This is sort of how Rails works, right? So you build higher and higher and higher stacks. 
you get to a point where you, you, know, you could build something like Devise in the Rails community because there's so much of what underpins Devise. You know, everybody uses the same uh, set of model abstractions. Everyone uses, has similar ways of talking about users. Right? So you can build an abstraction on top of that because everyone has sort of built up this shared understanding of what it is that we're doing. And it's so easy to let yourself be confused by the fact that the area of experimentation is the Wild West. And forget that, we're, that that area of experimentation is sitting on top of huge, a huge stack of abstractions. And this is sort of, I think, to me, the answer to why the Node community seems they're sitting on top of maybe you know, the most advanced dynamic language um, JIT in the world on top of all kinds of abstractions. And they sit on top and they say, oh my god, we need to build a lot of tiny modules because if we don't build tiny modules, this, the abstraction is going to kill us. But for me, this has always been a paradox. You're sitting on top of a stack of abstractions that's far higher than anything that you're claiming to be afraid of. So why are you so afraid? And I think it's because of this area of experimentation. right? When you're in an area of experimentation, of course abstractions are going to leak. You're still figuring out what it is that you're doing. But the goal of a good community that's going to help people be more productive is to eventually notice that the area of experimentation is over and move into a conventional system where you can say, we don't need to argue about this anymore. It was a worthy thing for us to discuss when we were, when we were thinking about the problem. But we can take that and we can roll it in into our set of shared defaults and we can climb up the ladder. Right? And this is, what, this is what Steve was saying. He was saying, you know, instead of having everybody start from some, some floor, sort of this is how iOS programming works today, right? ironically, is everyone starts from the same base. There's not a lot of shared programming, a lot of shared solutions. And I think fundamentally open source has been something that has really kick-started this idea of experimentation merged into the shared solutions. Because trying to centrally plan it the way uh, big companies like Apple or Microsoft do it is just not going to get the job done um, across the board. It'll, it'll solve some problems, but getting the open source communities, the power of the open source community, means that you can have all these little verticals, all these little areas where people are trying to build higher uh, abstractions for shared communities. Um, and interestingly, it's not enough to make these abstractions cheap. I think when you think about how people actually go and they build on top of these stacks, it's not enough if every layer in the abstraction stack, if uh, x86 and then C and then you know, Linux and POSIX, if every one of those things cost a little, by the time you actually got to build software, you would be so overwhelmed with the weight of the abstraction that you would never be able to do anything. So it's really fundamental that the abstractions that we build eventually get to the point where they're basically free, where they have no cognitive capacity, so that we can keep building higher and higher and higher. right? And the Rails philosophy is basically, how do you do that? How do you, how do you say, you know, we're going to experiment for a little bit, but eventually we're going to work really hard, we're going to push really hard at making the cost of that thing that everyone was just experimenting with a, min a, little, a minute ago free, so we can go build another level up and another level up. And I have a few sort of closing points to make about the ecosystem. So first of all, Rails is not the only way that we have to share. I think I was pretty sad when uh, the Q abstraction didn't end up in Rails, but I kind of am sad that we didn't get to see sort of what you can build up on top of the Q abstraction, and there's really no reason that all the Q guys didn't get together and say, you know, we're going to build some abstraction on top of that, and once you build the abstraction on top of that, then you can see how, how high you can go, right? And a sort of similar thing happened in the JavaScript community. In the JavaScript community, there were a lot of different um, promise implementations, and what happened over time is that people realized that not having a standard way to talk about this was actually making it hard to build up. So we said, let's actually get together and let's decide that we're going to have a standard way of talking about that. We'll call it Promises A+. And now promises are in the DOM. And now you know, we can build up another level and make asynchronous things look synchronous. And then we can build up another level and we can put that idea into the language. And you know, I don't know where we're going to go from there, but we can start building higher and higher abstractions, but it requires taking the first step. So I, I guess what I'm saying is ra getting something into Rails core is not the only way that you can build these abstractions. It, it requires some discipline to actually get to the point where we're agreeing on something. But I think if you find that there is some topic, like, for example, jobs uh, or uh, you, you know, queuing or jobs, and everybody does them, or a lot of people do them, but we don't have a good way of building on top of them, that's a good opportunity for someone to go and say, I'm going to do the hard work to say, let's create a shared idea of what it is that we're doing. And sometimes it's via interop layer, and sometimes it's via standardizing around one solution. 
And another part of this is um, when I started working on Ember in the JavaScript community, I thought a lot of these ideas were obvious. I thought it was going to be you know, a slam dunk. Everybody should agree that building a shared set of solutions is the right thing. And what I found was that, what I found instead is how powerful the unique snowflake bias is and how powerful the leaky abstraction fallacy can be in communities that don't place a high value on shared solutions. So if you don't see the power of shared solutions, if you're not familiar with the idea, with the wins, it's really easy to pull out those old canards, the I am a unique snowflake. I can't use a tool like Ember because I have special needs. I need to use a toolkit that lets me build my own framework because my needs are also special. Or, you know, you know, I looked at Ember when it was new, and Ember leaked all over the place. So the law of leaky abstractions means you can't build in JavaScript a shared solution. But of course these things are not true. And I think what I want to say is I think Rails, 10 years on, has basically proved that these things are not true. Before Rails, people spent a lot of time working on their own bespoke solutions, convinced that their problem was just too special for shared solutions. And when Rails came out, they looked at the very idea of convention over configuration as a joke. And then one day, Rails developers started beating the pants off those people. And I think, in closing, if you find yourself in an ecosystem where developers still start from floor one every time, learn the lessons of Rails. Everybody should band together. Push back, both in your, in your own brain and on other people, on the excuses that drive us apart instead of the things that bind us together. The legacy of Rails isn't MVC or even Ruby. It's powerful 10 years of evidence that by sticking to our guns, we can build far higher than anyone ever imagined. Thank you very much.